I am Bill Berner. Um, my day job is that I run the physics demonstration lab here at Penn. Uh, that is a big room behind this uh, blackboard, and uh, essentially it's Mythbusters without cameras. Um, the faculty comes in and says, we're going to do circular motion, or we're going to do electricity, and what can we show the class to help them understand that? And so most of the time I'm behind the scenes and rolling this stuff out. Once a year, I get to do this, and I get to show off the stuff I have. So I'm really excited about the chance to show you this stuff. Um, but before we start talking about that, um, I'd like to give you an idea of where you are, because you're in a very special place. You may be in one of the most interesting places, technically, in the world. Uh, and that is the intersection of 33rd and Walnut. So, uh, the University of Pennsylvania is one of the oldest colleges in the United States. It was, you know, we, we claimed it had been founded in 1740 by none other than Ben Franklin. Uh, and Ben did many, many things here. Grew up in Boston, came here at age 17. Okay, about the same age that most of our Penn students come here. And we hope that every one of our Penn students changes the world as much as Ben Franklin did. Okay, although there's a bit of competition these days. Uh, so Ben not only started the school, but Ben is actually a, a very important scientist because he was the first guy to realize that electricity was a science. Now, what does that mean? Up to that point, electricity was kind of a parlor trick. Ben Franklin is the guy who put the names positive and negative on electricity, and you could easily argue that maybe he should have switched them. Okay, it might have been nice if the stuff that moved was positive, but no, those negative electrons. Uh, but he's also the guy who realized that charge was conserved, and that's what made it science, because that's a basic rule that you can now, you know, use to predict behaviors. So Ben Franklin was a terribly important guy. Uh, but we didn't name our building after him. We named our building after David Rittenhouse, who was the second big scientist in the colonies. And David Rittenhouse, after Ben Franklin passed away, David Rittenhouse really became the voice of uh, science in the country. And he did a number of things. He was an astronomer. He also is credited with inventing the diffraction grating, which is that clear plastic thing you see rainbows through. And it's also the same effect that you see rainbows in CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. If you have very close together lines on the surface of something, uh, those lines will break light up into the colors that make it up. But you came in this door, right? If instead of walking in this door and acting like you were interested in what I was doing, you were bored and looking around, you saw this dull, drab, rectangular brick building behind you, the Moore School of Electrical Engineering. It was in this building in 1946 that the computer was invented. That's right, the computer. So the people credited with this are John Mawkley and J. Presper Eckert. The latest Walter Isaacson book, The Innovators, has a great chapter on it. If you want more information, I would strongly recommend having a look at that. This computer was built in 1946, which was actually several moments before I was born. That's right. Okay, the computer's even older than me. Um, these guys had this building. They took 18,000 vacuum tubes. You probably have never seen a vacuum tube, okay, but the cutesy warm things that glow in amplifiers. Uh, they use a lot of electricity. They make a lot of heat. In 1986, they were burning $650 worth of electricity every hour to run their computer. Now that may sound like a lot of money now, but back then it was really a lot of money. If you didn't spend it on electricity, you could have bought a car with your $650. So today that amounts to like fifteen dollars or $20,000. Okay? It cost half a million of those great big 1946 dollars to build. Okay, but look at the data on it. It was a 5 kilohertz processor. Not mega, not giga, not, okay, kilo. This was a slow machine. It was so slow that the only things slower than this machine were people. So the machine was an improvement. Okay? Uh, look at this memory. Okay, whoa. <laughs> it's not even Q. 
kilobytes, 20 10-digit numbers. It turns out that your pocket TI-80 or TI-30 calculator could run rings around this thing. But at the time, there weren't TI-30s. At the time, this was it. Uh, the guys who built this computer were technical geniuses, but they were not real good at business. When they formed their co company, which was Univac, they decided that the world would need, how many of their products would the world need? They decided seven. The world would need seven computers. Your car wouldn't work with seven computers. Right? Most of your cars have 10 or 15. Okay? Why did the world need seven computers? Well, there were seven continents. And when you had to do a big problem, you would go to the computer on your continent. Okay? <laughs> things, things have changed. <laughs> so, the computer, the computer was invented across the street. Pretty big stuff. Okay, now, if we jump forward. Okay? We've got this building here. Now we're standing in front of the Moore School. This is us in Rittenhouse, okay? And here is the laboratory for research into the structure of matter. This was a building that Penn put up in the late 60s. It is a building in which, notice it doesn't say chemistry or physics because Penn realized that the place where discoveries were gonna happen was between chemistry and physics. And so they put up a building where there were no turf wars, where the chemists and the physicists didn't argue whether it belonged to them. And in that building, okay, a Penn chemist, a Penn physicist, and a visiting scholar from Tokyo figured out how to get plastics to conduct electricity. They did this in 1975. It took 25 years for the world to realize how important that was, and they were awarded a Nobel Prize in 1975 for that work. <coughs> If we go back, oh, there, go forward, oh, yes, we want to note this, okay, when your teachers tell you to wear those safety goggles, right, and you don't want to do it, notice if you're not wearing safety goggles, you don't win Nobel Prizes, okay, <laughs> so they're setting you up to win a Nobel Prize, wear those goggles. Um, as you leave, if you've got a, a chance to take a look, this is an old picture, this building is in the way, Immediately to the right of this building, we just put up another we, the University of Pennsylvania. I, I was not very much involved, okay? But my school put up a brand new building, stunning architecture. It looks like a crystal. It's an all-glass building, and it's a building devoted to nanotechnology. And the thinking is the same. This is an area that is emerging research. This is a place where discoveries are going to be made, and Penn wants to be ready to make those discoveries. So we're hoping that in 25 years, we're going to include in this presentation that building and some sort of wonderful successes that happened in that building. But that's going on right now. This work is an ongoing process at Penn. It's not history, it's current events. Okay, two of our four corners. So we're sitting in a building. Okay, what happened here? Well, in this building, we had a man named Raymond Davis working. And Dr. Davis started working at Brookhaven, but then moved to Penn. And he had an idea that to figure out what's going on with the sun, we, there's a problem. The sun is huge. It's a million miles across. Anything that happens in the middle of the sun has to go half a million miles to get out of the sun. And it turns out that the heat that gets generated at the center of the sun takes hundreds of thousands of years to get out. We think we know what's going on in the center of the sun, but of course, we won't know whether we're right for several hundred thousand years. There is one thing, however, that passes through almost all matter. It's called a neutrino. Neutrinos are produced in the process we think is running the sun. And of course, if we could get a look at those neutrinos, we would have an almost instant check on what's happening now at the center of the sun. And that's what Dr. Davis decided to do. Detecting neutrinos is really hard. Obviously, if they can pass through the sun, they pass through your detector. So you detect only about 1 in 10 billion neutrinos. Dr. Davis built a detector, a 100,000 gallon tank of cleaning fluid. When neutrinos hit uh, chlorine atoms, 
one in ten billion of them turn the chlorine atom into an argon atom. And Dr. Davis had figured out a way to count individual argon atoms. There's a task. The astronomers told him that he should count 12 neutrinos a month. When he did his experiment, he counted four. People said, yeah, right, I'm going to get excited about that. You're counting individual atoms? I doubt it. And so in 1968, when he made that report, he didn't get much respect. However, more people checked it out. Okay, they built further detectors. And one of the things that I discovered, okay, I taught high school for 25 years before I came to Penn. I've been here for about 20. I knew a lot about teaching science. I didn't know a lot about doing science. In the newspapers, they published this thing as the solar neutrino problem. At Penn, they called it the solar neutrino opportunity. Because if we know all the answers, these guys who are scientists don't have a job. It's the job of scientists to discover new things, to fix mistakes, to understand nature better. If we understand it, we don't need scientists. And so people here got very, very excited about the fact that something was, was amiss. It gave them work to do. And it's terribly important to know that. It's terribly important for you to know that there are no conspiracies in science. Nobody is trying to hide what's happening with global warming. Nobody is trying to hide what's happening with evolution. We have a building full of graduate students. And the only way they get a degree is by publishing new science. Every one of them will go bonkers if you can show up with something that might be a place where you could say, we need to change this. Here's new information, and I'm publishing it, and I can get my degree. There's nobody hiding anything. This is why science is such a credible human endeavor, because the job of science is to correct errors. And so in this instance, we had an exciting thing people worked very hard on. They discovered that Ray Davis was not wrong. There weren't enough neutrinos. So they decided the astronomers were wrong. There shouldn't have been 12. And they checked that, and the astronomers were right. Finally, they said, well, where can the problem be? Turned out the problem was with what we thought neutrinos were. In other words, it was necessary to correct our understanding of elementary particles. If you make a discovery that changes the way the world explains elementary particles, you win a Nobel Prize. And Ray Davis got a Nobel Prize in 2002. But of course, that was for work he did in 1968. This also gives us a great deal of respect for the Nobel Prize. They do not give it lightly. They take a lot of time and make sure that this was really important work. Um, this work continues here. Right now, in the first floor right next to us, our high-energy physics guys uh, were very much involved in the discovery of the Higgs boson. The detectors that gave them the information that led to that discovery were designed and built here at Penn. So there's all sorts of interesting research done. We've got guys sending balloons up from Antarctica to look for evidence of the Big Bang. Uh, so there's real science happening here, and you know there are pages being added to science books based on the work that happens. This is a research institution, and uh, it's in your city. It's kind of uh, kind of amazing to discover that this is going on, you know, this, this is the way people earn their living, which is kind of fun. Okay, so our topic today is motion. So, you know, in a PowerPoint display, it's kind of hard to show motion in still pictures, but when you look at this, you're pretty damn sure this guy's moving. <laughs> that slack rope is not a good sign. This was not what he planned to do this afternoon, okay? Um, because we are accustomed to things not moving, having some visible <coughs> means of support. All right, there seems to be gravity here, and this guy is going to be going somewhere. <laughs> so we need a vocabulary. If we're going to do good science, we need to get objective. Um, I'm kind of interested in cars. Um, if somebody came up to me and said, that was a really fast car, might catch my interest, but it would really matter who said it to me. I would indeed be interested if it was Mario Andre. I might be a little less enthusiastic if it were my grandmother. <laughs> They're going to use those words differently. Okay? 
We need to find a way to describe things so that what Mario Andretti says and what my grandmother says mean the same thing. And usually that means numbers. So how do we talk about motion with objective numbers? Well, this is a little less exciting motion. This is a tree growing. Okay? This is a tree growing in front of my first house. Okay? And for a lot of you, this is prehistoric. When I moved into the house in 1980, the first mail that we got came from the local government, and it said I was going to be fined unless I fixed the sidewalk. Because the tree in front of the house had grown, cracked the sidewalk, and made it a hazard to pedestrians. Having just bought a house, I didn't have a lot of money. I figured, you know, I'm going to fix that sidewalk myself. If you learn nothing today, learn this. You never want to fix your own sidewalk. <laughs> that is horrendously hard work. Okay, breaking cement, moving cement, mixing cement. Mixing cement is a monster. Okay, well in any case, I did it. I was so proud of myself, I carved a date in my new cement. So what you're seeing here isn't the old cement. This is the new cement. Okay, and this also proves that I'm a physicist because I was surprised to discover that the tree was still growing. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, I should have checked with a biologist and found out that this kind of thing happens. Okay, so here we are in this date. Okay, so where are we? It's now 1984, okay, um, and it is June 22nd, 1984, and the tree has pushed my new cement this fall. So how do I describe that motion? Well... First, we say how long did it take, and if we calculate this whole thing out, do the math, it's 1,509 days, okay? And then we say how far did we move, and it turns out we've moved three centimeters. Now, this isn't a spectator sport, right? <laughs> but we can still put a number on it, okay? I don't even think my grandmother would say fast here, <laughs> all right? Um, but... What we do is we take the measurement of how far it went and divide by the measurement of how long it took. And when we do that, we can come up with something in miles per hour. 5 times 10 to the minus 10 miles per hour. This is scientific notation. Maybe some of you haven't gotten there yet. This is a quick way of writing 10 zeros. And so, if it's got a minus sign, I move to the left and I move this decimal point 10 places, it's going to sit here with nine zeros in my five. So that's a tiny, tiny, tiny number. But it is a report. More importantly, I could actually, you know, if I'm going to live in this house for 10 years, now I could actually figure out, well, how much is the tree going to grow, and how much space do I need to put in the next cement that I pour? So the tree can grow and not hit the cement for 10 years, and I don't have to replace my sidewalk for 10 years. Because that's what we can do here. And of course, both my grandmother and Mario Andretti would give me the same report, and I could do it. So this idea of measuring motion numerically is a very important one. Um, so now, what about motion? Well, men have studied motion from the beginning of time, apparently. In fact, the way we got here is that our ancestors had, fig had, had noticed motion and reacted well. Because in the beginning, noticing motion wasn't the job of physicists. It was the job of folks living with saber-toothed tigers. Because if you don't notice the motion, you become lunch. <laughs> which means you're not anybody's ancestor. Okay? So our ancestors were pretty good at this. Okay? And we inherited that skill. When the world became a little less exciting, we continued to have that skill, and it was probably motion that caused the beginning of science. People said, well, I wonder, you know, how does that work? So the first people to be arrogant enough to think that what they discovered was worth writing down seemed to have been the Greeks. And the Greeks pointed out that when they pushed on something, it came to a stop, and the only way to keep it moving was to push on it. So that it seemed that things left to their own devices wanted to sit still. That was natural motion in their mind. And they felt that you needed a force to keep something moving. We're talking about uh, science several centuries before Christ. 
So what do we got? We got uh, 2,500 years ago. Okay. So things stay that way for 2,000 years. We finally get up into the mid-1600s and along comes Galileo. An arrogant Italian, is that redundant? I don't know. Um, <laughs> who is pretty sure of himself. He's also wealthy enough that he can spend time pursuing his own interests. Okay? And uh, so he's curious about motion. He can carve a hardwood ball to make it very round. He gets a nice smooth ramp. And of course, unlike most people living in the 1600s, he doesn't have a dirt floor in his house. He's probably got like polished marble. So this is not, y you know, a, uh, a rail against wealth. In fact, it's a statement about the development of technology. Up to this point in time, there wasn't enough technology, and the Greeks weren't dumb. So they didn't have a way to get rid of this complication called friction. But Galileo did. So if we have friction, this is what happens. But if we get rid of friction, <laughs> not enough technology. Mr. Franklin, please invent electricity. So we're blowing air in this tube. The tube has a bunch of pinholes in it. The air comes out. And essentially, we've got a one-dimensional air hockey table. Okay? So now we give this guy a push. Go. <laughs> and it crashes into the end and stops. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Greeks are wrong. An object in motion just keeps moving. Now, we haven't gotten rid of resistance completely. There's still a little air in the way, but there's a whole lot less friction. So Galileo notices this, writes it down, doesn't go too much further. In 1642, Galileo died. Do we lose this? Well, no, because the printing press has been invented, the most important invention in the history of mankind. But something else happens in 1642, and that is Isaac Newton is born. So I figured, you know, if you watch these PBS series, you know, Ken Burns and the Civil War and baseball and all of those things, when he does science, we've got Galileo on his deathbed and he's dying and he's handing the science baton to the infant Isaac Newton and he's saying, go dude, okay? So Isaac Newton comes along and Newton now says, wow, you know, that's pretty interesting, that thing that Galileo found. In fact, he didn't go far enough. And so I'm going to make a statement that an object at rest, just like the Greeks said, will remain at rest. An object in motion will continue to move forever, unless acted on by an outside force, at which time it does something different. Okay? It's going to move at a steady speed in the same direction. If the speed and direction don't change, we say it's got constant velocity. Velocity means I'm thinking about direction as well. Okay, there's an interesting thing happening here. There's a moment in time, and this happens in, in all great discoveries, there's a moment in time when the only guy on the planet Earth who knows this is Isaac Newton. It is not accidental that the guy who knew this is the guy who discovered gravity. Because up to this point in time, people were thinking, the problem with the planets is we need a reason for them to keep going. Because they were Greek. They thought that things don't keep going on their own. Isaac Newton comes along and says, you know, there's no problem with keeping going. The problem is turning. Because an object in motion will continue to move. You can't afford an air track, but you can go to Bed Bath & Beyond and catch the post-Christmas sale and get one of these for five bucks. Okay? So if you do that, we now can give this a push and we see that even without a track, it moves in a straight line. So if we go into outer space with our planet and we give our planet a push, it's just going to keep going. The surprising thing is, it doesn't just keep going, it goes in a circle. And so Isaac Newton was the only guy on the planet Earth who knew that the, the problem he had to answer was why does it turn, not why does it move. First guy to ask that question is going to say, I need gravity. Okay? And so this is a really important insight to have. 
Each time you get a new discovery, it gives you a tool to take you to the next step. And so, Newton's discovery and this behavior is something that we call inertia. Now, that leads us to some interesting other behaviors. This shows you how to make a frictionless puck with this obsolete device called a CD. You put the label side down because it's flat. You hot, hot glue the top to a water bottle on it. You put a balloon on it, okay? This thing pops in and out to keep the water in your bottle. This, of course, is in case the Bed Bath & Beyond sale is over, <laughs> okay? So now we've got this guy here. I pop that lid back in, and if I let the air out, Inertia. It keeps doing what we started it to do. Okay? So Pete Harnish, who is uh, the guy who runs our undergraduate labs, is going to show us a second aspect of this because now we've got a rule that we didn't have before. So we've already established that something in motion will continue in motion. So we're now going to add another element to this, specifically a second object. So instead of the air track, we're going to use this cart. And on top of this cart, we have a ball launcher. So, <coughs> by climbing the launcher, okay. Okay. it will launch a ball. When it passes this mark, so as we can see, when it hits here, it goes straight up and straight back down. So the question is going to be, if I push the cart, so the cart is rolling down the track, where will the ball end up? Do we have any thoughts? It'll go, go right down onto the track since the, the ball module will fall in. Alright, so we have that it will go straight up and back down, just like before. Alright? Alternate thoughts. It'll go back into the cart. It'll go back into the cart, but the cart's going to be down there. Well, the ball's um, still moving, even though it's at... Okay, so we have the thought that it will go straight up and down. We have the thought that it will go up and land back in the cart. Do we have any other theories? Is it going to shoot that way? Is it going to go that way and take Bill's eye out? <laughs> All right, well this is science, so we have to do it as an experiment. <laughs> Alright, let's try this one more time. See if I can. Uh, of course, you can look at it from above here. As you like to do in science, we add another layer of complication. What if I stop the cart? Alright, so it's going to start the same way. It's going to roll. The ball's going to be launched, and then I'm going to stop the cart here. Now where does the ball end up? First hand? The ball's going to go that way. Alright, so the ball's going to go that way. Alright? Alright, so we have the thought that the ball's going to keep going. Right? Any other thoughts? Is the ball... Will the cart still catch it? Alright? Find out. Alright. Why does the ball keep going? Yeah. When you stop the thing, then the ball just moves. All right. the thing. Exactly. I stopped the cart. I didn't stop the ball. That's the whole thing we've been talking about here. The ball has inertia. It's moving. It's going to keep moving until something stops it. So they start together, but since I only stopped one of them, there's no reason the other one is going to stop. So this is that an object in motion will stay in motion. We're now going to go over to another example that objects at rest will stay at rest. Okay, so here we have an object, and remember that property that Pete just described is called inertia. One word instead of a couple of sentences, okay? So this is three kilograms of inertia, all right? Uh, real quick point, what's the difference between inertia and weight? Physics books are 
made huge and annoying so that every student in the class has a big lump of inertia. Okay? So if you take your physics book and hold it out at arm's length, it's annoying your rotator cuff here, if you're an old man, because it's being pulled to the center of the earth. That's weight. If, however, you try to swing it back and forth, it's annoying your rotator cuff because it's got mass. It's got inertia. If we go into outer space and hold this out at arm's length, that's not hard to do. There's no earth to be attracted to. But if we try to wiggle this thing back and forth, it continues to be hard. It's just as hard to do that because this book in outer space still doesn't want to change what it's doing. If I'm on my way to Alpha Centauri and I'm stuck in a spaceship for five years with another annoying astronaut and about a year and a half into the event they piss me off. <laughs> I take the operator's manual and throw the weightless operator's manual across the spaceship and it's headed towards my annoying fellow astronaut who says, it's weightless, I don't have to worry. <laughs> Comment. Yes, sir. Well, the mass will always stay the same no matter what the effect is. Okay, the mass is the same, but what does that mean for my astronaut uh, non-friend? That uh, the velocity will stay the same, which is no outside force acting on it. All right. So that means it's going to get to him, but then what? Yes. It's still going to hurt. It's still going to hurt. It is going to keep going until an outside force changes things. That outside force is his temple. He's still not happy. Okay. So inertia is a resistance to changes in motion, and it does not relate to massive weight. Okay, so here's an object with both weight and inertia. Three kilograms of inertia. Near the surface of the earth, that's seven and a half pounds of weight. We've got kite cord here, capable of holding about ten pounds. The kite cord is slightly stronger than it has to be to hold this. Okay? What's this yellow thing? The yellow thing is proof that I'm a genius. Because if I don't put the yellow thing in here and this piece of string breaks, it comes down and crushes my hand. And after only two or three tries, I realized I should put this yellow thing in okay? So the yellow thing is a safety thing. It's got nothing to do with the physics we're looking at. Okay? We want to pay attention to the kite pool. So I've now got seven pounds pulling on a ten pound kite cord. I have a ten pound kite cord down here. I am going to pull. I'm going to keep pulling until something breaks. Mm -hmm. What is going to break? <laughs> what is going to break? Okay. Obviously there's a couple of possibilities. Okay, how many people think the top is going to break? Okay. How many people think the bottom is going to break? What do you mean by the bottom? Thereby proving that most of the occupants of this room are stones in terms, right? There's no thought. The rest of you have no thought. You do have the opportunity to use a stone or a term. Okay? Um, so now, I pull on this. Okay, let's visualize the situation. All right. I'm sure you can come up with something of a, uh, a behavior, and it's important to come up with something. It's not important to come up with the right thing. Okay? In science, we want a hypothesis. We go in, we see how that works. If it doesn't work, we go back and make adjustments. Okay? So, top string. Oh, look at that. It's become much more popular. Bottom string. Uh, <laughs> Silly. Silly Jackson. Okay. Why not? Well, let's take a look. That. Somebody give me an explanation as to why the top string was an appealing choice? It had 
the yellow part of it to help it out while the bottom was just one part. Oh, look at look at how slack that is. Remember I said ignore the man behind the curtain. No, no, the, the yellow <laughs> cord. Okay. So the yellow guy isn't really helping. Mm. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, because the top kite cord already has like a lot of force from the three kilogram. So then, like, if you add more, like, I would just think that it would just like snap automatically. Okay. So you think that the top is is combining my pull and this? So why didn't it break? Well, let's try this again. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, so it's both? <laughs> 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 I know. How can it be both? There's like an equal chance. There's an equal chance? Because like the weight between the two. I don't know. Because see, I can do it either way. I just have to pick who I want to make look foolish in the audience. <laughs> now, how can I make it go either way? You put too much force on it the first time. How did I do that? By pulling on it too hard. Pulling on it too hard. You're in the ballpark. We, we want to choose our words a little bit. I think we're going down the track. Fast. Okay? So, if you, and, and being a good scientist is not terribly different than being a good detective. The details are very important. So, in fact, I did not do the same thing both times. So, let's, let's think about what's going on here. If I pull really, really fast, in order for the top string to break, the mass has got to suddenly get moving as fast as my hand. How does that happen? I deliver force through this 10 pound kite cord, it takes more than 10 pounds to get this thing to move as fast as my hand. And so if I do that, this lump of inertia protects this string. But, and let's use the same string. So you know, you say, well, you're using, you know, you're cheating and using different string. Well, let's use the same string and get a different result. So now, if I pull slowly, this guy can keep up with my hand because the force that I'm putting in here now is working just as you described. I'm adding my downward force to the weight of this and I pull slowly. I think. And the top breaks. So the inertia of this mass, the resistance of the mass to changing is the way I get this to go. Now, can you believe me? Well, notice the bungee cord. This actually lets us see what's happening. If I pull slowly, I can in fact deliver enough force through this spring to move this guy, right? But let's pull really fast. So this thing can move. It's on a springy cord, but if I go really rapidly, it doesn't move much at all. Okay? It simply can't keep up. The string fails before it does much movement. This is what we mean by inertia. Okay? Um, all right. Now we've got a principle. As we said about Isaac Newton, if you know something that hasn't been known up to this point in time, you may have a chance of solving a problem that is insolvable up till now. So the world had been very interested by astronomy because at night you had this wonderful sky and of course up until fairly recently it was pretty dark and you could see all the stars, the planets, and things moved. And so the question arose, why are they moving? Are they moving because the sky is moving and we're sitting still? And that's how it felt because of course nobody was getting motion sickness. Okay? Or is it happening because the sky is stationary and the earth is turning? And for most of man's history, that was a philosophical question, which is to say, your best bet at answering it was to think clearly because you couldn't collect evidence. Okay? However, now that we know something about inertia, we may be able to collect evidence. Because if we take a pendulum, and notice we've got aerial photography here, okay? Uh, and we swing this, the inertia of this pendulum is such that it's going to hold its position and move in the same line repeatedly. 
It does not want to change what it's doing. All right. Now we've got two cameras. Notice they're both seeing the same view. However, the one camera is mounted on the earth and the other camera is mounted in the sky. So that camera is basically looking in from the stars. This camera is looking in from the earth. Okay, the French physicist Foucault said, you know, if I get a pendulum and I put it on a moving earth and it's moving in such a way that it's turning, which is to say it's changing what it's doing. Instead of going this way, I'm now going that way, going that way, going that way. So let's imagine we put the pendulum at the North Pole. When the Earth, well, if the Earth is turning, the pendulum will keep swinging back and forth at the same stars, and the Earth will move, the pendulum and the stars will remain fixed. But if the stars are moving, the pendulum will keep going in the same direction, staying with the Earth, and the sky will move. So if we do this at the North Pole, which we have done, please notice, we've spared no expense. We have a map of the North Pole. Here's Greenland, right? And here's northern Canada and evil Siberia. And we need an observer at the North Pole. And luckily, it's easy to find a North Pole observer. Okay? And so this observer is going to report to us. And we should know that we can find out. Now, if, if the Earth's not moving, let's look at that. And so this happens. Now, we can't move the sky. But you notice that this all stays pretty stable. But now, what if the Earth moves? Then it's going to get smashed by the pendulum. So please notice on the overhead view, here, this, this pendulum is doing crazy things. But over here, it's moving horizontally back and forth across the screen. As the turntable moves, the pendulum keeps moving in the same line. So indeed, the pendulum's got inertia. We, however, are not on a star. We're on the Earth, and we've got this weird behavior. Now, does that really happen? You do not have to go to the North Pole. You only have to go to the Franklin Institute. Okay? When you go to the Franklin Institute, the plan is go to the center stairway, and we've got, they've got a great big pendulum. There's a fence at the bottom because this pendulum will do to you what our pendulum just did to Santa. It's a 1,500 pound pendulum. They set it into motion in the morning. So if you get to the, the rail like these people have, take note of where the pendulum is, and they're helping you because they've got a bunch of chess pieces in a ring around the bottom. And so the pendulum moves back and forth, note what it's doing when you arrive, and then spend your few hours at the Franklin Institute, and before you leave, come back and take a look. And you will notice that more chess pieces are down because the earth is turning under the pendulum, the pendulum is holding its position, and this was the first proof that the Earth moved in the heavens. And this is really the way the edifice of science is built. We start to figure out fundamental rules, we apply the fundamental rules to the next level of questions, and we get answers to them, which gives us more information and lets us go even further. Okay, and so the simple idea of what are the rules of nature suddenly begins to answer these questions that have persisted for thousands of years.
of motion, inertia. Then there's Newton's second law of motion, which we're not going to spend much time on because it's pretty straightforward. It's, if something is big, you need to push harder on it to get it to move. I think we all kind of understand that one. So we're going to jump straight to Newton's third law of motion, which is a little bit more confusing. Most of you have probably heard it as, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Which sounds a little bit like revenge. Like, you hit me, so I'm going to hit you, and it's back and forth. So what we like to say instead is that forces always come in matched pairs. So, we have a cart here. It has a spring plunger on it. And if I trigger that plunger, it moves the cart. Now, that kind of looks like there's only one force. We have a cart that's pushing and it moves. Where's the second force? Well, the second force is the track pushing on the cart. Except the track is attached to the table, which is attached to the earth. So the earth's not going to move much when you push on it. But we can take the side of the track out of the equation. So if I hit the plunger again, while it's here in the middle of the track, it's still on the level. The cart and the track are, I think that level is <laughs> There we go. So now we're away from the edges of the track. So what's going to happen when I trigger this plunger? Is it going to move? Yeah. All right. We think maybe it's going to move. Move. It certainly moved before when I hit that plunger. Right? Nothing. Right? There's nothing for it to push against. Right? So it's left kind of floating in space. But if we give it something to push against. Say another cart. Yeah. It will trigger correctly. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so they can push on each other, right? Now, so with cars, this. It's kind of simple and makes sense, right? Just cards. So let's abstract slightly into how do we move around, right? So when I'm trying to walk, I'm pushing on the earth with my feet, right? And I'm walking. Where is the reaction in that? Right? I'm pushing on the earth. Where is the other motion? The earth is pushing back over here. Right. The Earth is pushing, right? The Earth is moving a little bit. Unfortunately, I weigh a little more than I should, but not much. <laughs> the Earth weighs about six trillion trillion kilograms. So it's not gonna move much. But if we instead do motion on something that is free to move. So we might as well take, we might as well upgrade slightly. Instead of walking, we're going to drive. Because we can. So, the car is on the track. The track is on rollers. If I drive the car forward, what's going to happen? The car will stay in relative place and it will just be on the track back or forward forward. Okay. So now the car is going to be pushing on the track, but the track is also free to push on the car. So they're free to move back and forth. Right? It's a good demonstration of third law. Of third. That is why you need to wear grippy shoes. That's why you can't really walk on ice, because you can't push on anything. Now, this is moving around on Earth. Right? If we want to take it one step past Earth, we can then talk about how to move around in air. So now we need to be able to push yes. air. Yes. Right? So, and, and think about any fluid. You don't do much traveling in air, but you travel in water, right? How do you make yourself move in water? 
And we should point out that that's the reason they don't allow flippers in Olympic swimming. Wow. Because the more water you can push on, the better push you get. If you're a competitive swimmer, I hope you are aware of the fact that that kick turn at the end of the pool is tremendously important. It's the one place where you get to use all of your strength. Because you just plain can't push so hard on water. You know, you're, you're much stronger than the water you can move. But you can push really hard on the side of the pool because it's connected to the earth. Okay? So we're going to push fluid backward. We do it with our hands in a swimming pool. An airplane does it with a propeller. If the fluid goes backward, and remember, we're surrounded by it. So all we got to do is grab it and push it, just like in the water. So let's see what happens when we turn this on. What's the problem? We have not controlled our variables. We've got the same problem the ancient Greeks did. Friction is overwhelming the behavior. So, we're going to get rid of some friction. Pushing the 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 wood that way, but then the wood, I guess, is well, the air is pushing the fan that way. So that means that it's either it's whatever is holding them together is strong enough, it's not going to move anywhere. But if it isn't, you're they saying break each other. that this person up front who told me it wasn't going to move is actually right. Well, it should be. I guess we should try, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so basically what we've got is the air is a middleman. So when the fan pushes the air, we've got our pair of forces. A force on the fan blades that way, a force on the air this way. That should get the fan and the cart going there, but then the air comes down here and runs into the board. 
We've now got a force of the board on the air sending it this way, a force of the air on the board pushing it that way, and so your description is exactly right. Those two forces <laughs> fight each other to a standstill. Now we've actually done bad science here because we changed two things. We changed the presence of the sail and we added the big heavy dumb old physics teacher. So we don't know whether the big heavy dumb old physics teacher is the reason this isn't moving. So we've got to try that. Let's get the sail out of here and leave me on here. Okay? okay. <laughs> There are no behaviors that are just one of those laws of motion. But we just saw an example of the second law. Because the second law says acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. So acceleration is the rate at which we're changing our speed, and you notice it was very, very slow, right? And it was slow because all of my inertia got added to this. If you know how strong that fan is, you can tell me what I weigh right now. But we're not telling. Okay? <laughs> All right, so that brings us, we figured out how to move on solid ground, how to move in air and water. So, of course, the real question is, how do we move in space? So, we could say, well, yeah, let's do We can demonstrate that. If you throw stuff out the back, the reaction is that this goes forward. And so, you know, in most physics classes, the way we demonstrate this behavior, action, reaction, is part of the balloon. But you didn't come here to see any stinking balloon, right? You came here to see a rock. So, what do we have here? version of a fire extinguisher. So, we've got a CO2 fire extinguisher. This is going to fire out carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, gas. As with almost everything we're doing here, we're going to say, do not try this at home. Okay. And we should also say, is every fire extinguisher a rocket? And the answer is no, they work very hard at making them non-rockets. Okay? So hard, in fact, that part of my job is to figure out how to make a fire extinguisher into a rocket. So what they normally do, the nozzle that comes out is blocked at the end. So we do not have a thrust coming out the end, and instead they put holes around the side, so the carbon dioxide comes out these holes and cancels each other's motion. We've got it going left and right, front and back. But what we've done is sawed that off, and we now have just an open pipe. Okay? So, the point that I'm making is that when things get a little crazy, you've got a fire in your house, you can use the fire extinguisher and not expect to be launched into the wall on the far side of the room. Okay? However, if you work hard at it, you can get your fire extinguisher. So we've taken the hose, and the hose is now shooting out the back of this thing. Please note the unexplained pile of boxes. Please note that to add interest, we put a test pilot on the rock. All we can do. That Pete knows what's going on, so if I die, the second half of the show. Are we ready?
it in, in an attempt to kill myself, but we put the boxes there for a physics reason. What did they do for us? They fell. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say that loud. Okay, they showed the other force. In other words, that is the third law. It was quite obvious I had one force that was moving me and the sled forward. If we didn't put that here, these ladies would have known there was a force. Okay? <laughs> we could get their testimonial. Okay, they were a bit shocked by the event. But from a distance, a little you could see that we blew these boxes right out of the room. So there was a force in that direction on the boxes, there was a force in that direction on the car. This is the reason that unlike NASA, okay, we let people sit at the launch site, okay? NASA knows that they can't afford to have people at the launch site, okay, because of that reaction force. Okay, we are going to... Pretty cool, huh? Magic. Okay, we're taking a 10-minute break. Real 10 minutes, right? This is physics. We are going to keep track of our numbers because if you take longer than 10 minutes, the really cool last thing that we do in the show won't happen because we won't have time. Okay? So men's room, you go down there to the last door and go down. Ladies' room, you go up there.